We read from the first epistle of John in chapter 2 and from verse 15. First epistle of John, chapter 2 and verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things." I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, Let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us come now to God in prayer. Let us all pray. Our gracious God, again we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, for the glory of the revelation that has come to us in him in his person, and in his work. We thank you that in him all of the shadows of Old Testament days find their fullest expression. And he is then the great antitype of all those types and shadows that are there in, uh, in the pages of the Old Testament scriptures. We thank you that he is the fulfillment of the tabernacle, that tabernacle with its fence that spoke of the fact that we were excluded from your presence, that we were outside. But we thank you that there was a door by which men could come, uh, humbling themselves as they came into your presence. We thank you that we can come through Christ, the door, uh, near to your presence, uh, an altar, and shed blood for one must die in the place of a sinner. We thank you that that finds its fulfillment also in our Lord Jesus Christ, the great laver where a man would cleanse himself, and for the cleansing that we find 
in the Lord Jesus Christ, that table with its twelve loaves, speaking of God and your care for us, the fact that you feed us, that we do not serve you and sustain you, but you sustain your people, the lampstand bringing light that we might see, an altar of incense. We thank you, Lord, that all these things find their wonderful fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we don't look back and long for those days, that we don't long to see a Shekinah cloud of glory over a tabernacle in a desert, but that we see God in Christ Jesus who said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And we thank you then for the glory and the grace and the truth that was manifested in the Lord Jesus Christ and that looking at him we see God in the flesh, God amongst us. How we thank you then for this supreme revelation and we thank you for the testimony of the Holy Scriptures that we have that speak of this great Saviour. And we thank you for the hope that is held out before us that one day our eyes shall see him. My eyes shall see my Redeemer and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. We thank you for that testimony of Job thousands of years ago that still it is the testimony of your people. I know that my Redeemer lives. He shall stand at the last upon the dust of the earth, and in my flesh I shall see God. And we know then, Lord, that is the beginning of our holiest, happiest, healthiest days, when the image of God shall have been perfectly restored in us. We shall see him and be like him. Oh, for that hope and for the confidence that we have in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, we magnify and glorify your name. We Remember, as we've seen before us even this evening on this table, a body broken and blood shed. We thank you for such simple, solemn and sublime elements that speak of that glorious reality that took place centuries ago, but still its efficacy and its power is known in our life and in our experience to this day. And it is the focal point of heaven, all the angels of God, worshipping the Lamb in the midst of the throne, and the myriads and myriads of the redeemed gathered around that sea of glass, casting their crowns before him. And we look forward to that day when we too shall stand in that heavenly throng, and we shall join our songs with theirs. Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins, unto him be the glory. We pray that such Heavenly contemplations will help us day by day to sit loose to this world that is passing away and its glory and its fashions, to hold it all with a slight grasp, knowing that one day we must say goodbye to it all and enter into glories and riches and a treasure and into such a presence of the living God that presently we cannot comprehend. Such is its fullness and its glory and its wonder. But oh, that our hearts and minds may be expanded tonight to understand more of the love of God for us in Christ Jesus, that we may speak to men and women and boys and girls of such wonders and such glories, bearing faithful witness to the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank you then, gracious God, for such mercies. We pray that you would be with your people again, those who are on our hearts and minds even now as we pray, who stand in particular need of your help and strength and grace, who are in the midst of trials and difficulties that would naturally uh, draw their minds and their hearts uh, to the things that are immediately apparent to them. But help them now, we pray, wherever they are, to lift their eyes to you that their eyes may be unto you, the God of salvation and the God of all grace, and that you might minister your grace to them in their weakness and in their need and uh, in all their felt uh, helplessness. Be a strength and a tower and a refuge for your people, O Lord, their rock and their defense. We thank you that you speak of yourself in such wonderful ways in Holy Scripture, for so often we are brought to feel our weakness and our need 
and so soon uh, we are brought down. Oh, bear up your people, we pray today, with that grace that is sufficient, and grant them to know and to experience in a particular way that you are indeed the God of salvation, their Lord and their help. We ask again for our land, and we pray, Lord, that we would live to see better days, a day when your name is made a praise in the earth, here in Wales again, and throughout this land of the United Kingdom and Europe. Oh, that you'd raise up men mighty in the word and empowered by the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, that your word would come with power and grace to this generation. Hear our prayers, Lord. We ask them in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We turn this evening to the Gospel of Mark and chapter 15. Mark's Gospel, chapter 15 and from verse 33. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone, let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now when the evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. The cross of the Lord Jesus highlights so much concerning human life and Human reactions to God and to God's word. There's nowhere where our attitude to God is seen more clearly than it is at the cross. Faced with the death, the cross of Jesus Christ, we either believe in him or we reject him. And if we don't believe him, then we reject him. Uh, The cross demands a response from us, you see. And it always meets with a response. We either come to him because of it, Or we turn away from him because of it. Jesus himself said, He that is not with me is against me. There is no middle course when it comes to Jesus Christ. And confronted with the cross of Jesus Christ, we either come to him or we turn away from him and we reject him. And that's what happened then, of course. There were many people who were witnesses to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus who rejected him. Many of the soldiers, the religious leaders, The bystanders that we read of earlier in this passage, the soldiers who were there primarily interested in the crucifixion because of the perks that they could get out of it. They are mentioned from verse 22 to 27. They had no appreciation of what was taking place there at Calvary. The religious leaders mentioned in verse 31 to 33, uh, 32, they were there standing, we're told, in little groups, 
scoffing at Jesus amongst themselves. And their words are heavy with sarcasm and criticism. They're spiteful men. And the passers-by are mentioned in verse 29. And they come just to pour scorn upon Jesus. And the condemned criminals in verse 32. Even they heap scorn upon Jesus on the cross. And just as those scoffers gathered there at the cross, so people today jeer and scoff, and they cast their insults at Jesus and at his cross. The cross is an offence to people, and it arouses hatred and hostility. And yet, despite all that, there were those present who trusted in him. And we know that those who rejected Jesus did that despite all of the evidence that was given to them that should command their faith, the miracles, the words of Jesus, his care for people, and supremely the way in which he died. And yet, despite all these evidences that Scripture provides for us and that they had before their very eyes, people then still refused to believe upon him. But there were those who did believe And we've read about them in this short passage here tonight. And we have much to learn, I think, from their witness as to what they saw and the truth as they understood it. Of course, the greatest witness of all mentioned here is God himself. Uh, For when Jesus, we're told, breathed his last, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, torn in two. And in that action, God was saying something about his son that ought to have commanded their attention and ours. And not only did God tear the veil of the temple in that wonderful way, but as we know, on the third day, following the death of Jesus, he raised him from the dead and gave us the sign above all signs that ought to cause us to believe upon his Son, the Lord Jesus, our Saviour. So we haven't any excuse for not believing upon the Son of God. God could not have done more than he has done to persuade us to put our trust and confidence in his Son, Jesus Christ. So the greatest witness of all to Jesus is God himself. But then we read in this passage of three witnesses, uh, three human witnesses, and, and they stand out like Athanasius against the world. Even though other people, even though the majority of people come to a conclusion about Jesus, which is one of unbelief, these witnesses believe. One is reminded of Samuel in the Old Testament, who in a time of decline and apostasy amongst the people of God was given the word of God. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel. One man, well, a young boy, in fact, amidst a nation that had forgotten God. And out of that experience of the word of God coming to him, he was raised up as a great prophet in Israel. What that shows us is that none of us need to be worrying about the Christian church or the future of God's gospel in the world. We shouldn't worry about clever little books that come out from time to time that disparage and dismiss the Christian faith. They've always come out, and they'll come out again until Christ returns. Jesus says there'll always be those who oppose his gospel. But there's no need for us to be anxious over that. God is quite capable, you see, of defending himself and defending his gospel, and defending his church. And he is able to promote it in whatever way he chooses and when he pleases. Even though the whole world stands against God and against his gospel, he will see to it that there will always be in this world true and faithful witnesses to him and to his word. There is no need to fear. Well, here are three witnesses. And the first is this centurion in verse 39, a Gentile. And no doubt, being a centurion, a hard-bitten, experienced Roman soldier, a centurion, which meant that he was in charge of a considerable number of soldiers, at least 600. And that itself seems to indicate a considerable military presence at the crucifixion. A centurion was there, in charge of soldiers, 
in charge of the crucifixion. He's responsible for it to ensure that it's carried out and carried out in the right way and that the person who was to be crucified was actually dead. That was his responsibility. A tough man, a man of the world, a ruthless man in some respects, I'm sure, a strong man. And we're told that he stood right in front of the cross of Jesus. There was the cross of Jesus. He stood right in front of it, facing it, watching Jesus as he died. And this hard-bitten man of the world, this Roman centurion, saw strange things that day. The darkness, the strange, supernatural, eerie darkness that surrounded the scene. The earthquake that Matthew tells us about in his gospel, which is enough to frighten anyone. The amazing words spoken by this person who was being crucified before him between two thieves. Words penetrating, coming out from the darkness. And yet the most impressive thing of it all that Mark draws our attention to here is the way in which Jesus of Nazareth actually died. He clearly had died. This centurion, you see, knew all about death. We're told that Jesus breathed his last. If you've ever been with someone who is dying, if you've been with them when they draw their last breath, you know what that means. There's no doubt about it. When a person breathes their last, you know. Now this centurion saw Jesus breathe his last. That's the way it's put here. And yet there is something astonishing about the way Jesus breathed his last. For one thing, we are told he had uttered loud cries. And for another, he had bowed his head. That is not how crucified men died but submi submissively and in sovereign power, controlling the very moment of his death. And then those last words, the centurion had never heard anything like that before from a dying man. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The centurion had never seen anyone die like Jesus died. And as he saw it, and as he heard, and as he watched, this was his conclusion. Truly, it's an emphatic word, truly, this man was the Son of God. He saw it, he confessed it, he believed. This is how Mark begins his gospel, isn't it? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then that's the climax of the first part of Mark's gospel when Peter is at Caesarea Philippi and he confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And here it reaches another high point, but not now a Jew, a Gentile. This centurion confessing Jesus Christ to be the Son of God and he's filled with awe and amazement and wonder at the person of Jesus. Truly! And he's willing to say it. And he says it out loud for people to hear. Truly, I don't know, perhaps he turned around to the people who were there and said, truly, this man is the Son of God. Do you realize what we've done? We've crucified the Son of God. He saw it. He confessed it. And you and I have got to do the same. We've got to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is what it means, in part. That's what it means to be a Christian. You've got to believe and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That he is God, no less than God. And no one is a Christian without first confessing that Jesus Christ is God. He's not just a man, but this man is the Son of God. The Apostle Paul tells us the same that that's what it means to be a Christian if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you shall be saved and our Lord himself said do you remember on more than one occasion he warned people everyone who shall confess me before men I will confess him before my father who is in heaven but whoever denies me before men I will deny him before my Father in heaven. 
We are meant to confess that Jesus is Lord. That is part of what it means to be a Christian. The Apostle Paul, uh, sorry, the Apostle John says that in his epistle, doesn't he? Uh, he draws our attention to the fact that you can't really believe in God the Father without believing also upon God the Son. Notice how he put it. We read it a little earlier. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. You can't be a true believer if you do not acknowledge, if you do not confess that Jesus is the Son of God. We are to confess him openly with our mouths as well as believing upon him in our heart. The centurion did that. He confessed Jesus was the Son of God. So we have his witness and his testimony here. And then in verse 40, we have the witness of the women. In various gospel accounts, we are told about more than three, but three of them are named here. Mark mentions Mary Magdalene. She came from the village of Magdala, and out of her, we are told, the Lord had cast seven demons. She had been demon-possessed, but the Lord had delivered her. Then there was Mary, the mother of James the Less, and of Joses, James the Less, as he's called here, we could translate that James the Little One. It's probably, most probably, a reference to the fact that he was a short man, had short stature. Could mean that he was young, but it's more likely referring to his stature. She was the wife of Cleopas, and then Salome is mentioned, and Matthew tells her that she was the mother of, of Zebedee's children, that is, James and John, the apostles. And the fact that Matthew speaks of her uh, in that way seems to indicate that by that time uh, Zebedee was probably dead and she was a widow. So these three are named and they were there around the cross. They'd been there for some time. They were looking on at the cross from a distance. They weren't allowed to come near to the cross. They were women. And women in those days counted for nothing. And they're there at the back of the crowd. They're not able to get near to the cross. And they have to watch Jesus die from a distance. But they're loyal and they're true and they're faithful women. And they were witnesses to the death of Jesus also. They were there. They saw him dying. And they knew that his death was real. And these women, we're told, were also witnesses of his burial. They actually saw the tomb in which the Lord Jesus was laid. You remember how Joseph of Arimathea took the body of Jesus from the cross. He wrapped it in linen and laid the body in a tomb, hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone over the entrance. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, they were there. They saw exactly where the body of Jesus was placed. So they were witnesses not only to his death, but also to his burial. They knew which tomb it was. That's a very important detail in the Gospels because of what happened on the day of resurrection. And then they were witnesses to his resurrection. The first witnesses, these women, these women, because they went out early to the tomb on the morning and found it empty. So they are witnesses. And we're told in verse 41 that they administered to Jesus along with other women. That's a wonderful detail. We think of the cross uh, perhaps, and uh, we forget the presence of these ladies, these women who were there, these women who seemed to have more courage than the disciples had. They were there. Luke tells us about some of them in his gospel in Luke chapter 8 and verse uh, 2 and 3. Some of them were wealthy, Listen to how he speaks of them. Certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him, that is Jesus, from their substance. Clearly some of them were influential people and wealthy, and they used their money to support the ministry of Jesus and the disciples. Now, there's great significance 
to the witness of these women. You see, in New Testament times, the testimony of women was inadmissible in law. They simply would not be allowed to give evidence in a court of law. That was the view that the Roman Empire took of women. Their testimony was unacceptable. Incidentally, if the writers of the Gospels were seeking to persuade people of a myth uh, that Jesus was the Son of God and that he'd been raised from the dead, if they were just trying to pull a fast one on people, they certainly would not have emphasised the testimony of women as witnesses. They would, that would have been a ridiculous thing for them to have done because people would quite naturally have discounted the testimony of women anyway. And yet that's what they do. They emphasise the witness of women. And it's just one of, a little, one of many little details, I think, that emphasises for us the authenticity of the New Testament story. These women, whose evidence would not be given any credence whatsoever in those days, whose testimony simply would not have been accepted, these are the witnesses and the first witnesses. You see, God doesn't do things our way. He's not like us silly human beings. He doesn't give way to our petty differentiations and discriminations. He mocks our prejudices and he chooses women as the first witnesses to the resurrection. You see, God doesn't jump to your command or mine and he just doesn't do things our way. He is God and he won't be told by arrogant, impudent Foolish people, how best to do his work and how to go about accomplishing salvation and his purposes in the world. And so he chooses women. He mocks us. And then there is a third witness, Joseph of Arimathea. We're told about him from verse 43. We're told a number of things about him. He was rich, he was prominent, he was a leading member of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin he was a disciple of Jesus. He was a good man, a righteous man. But he was a secret disciple for fear of the Jews. Clearly he was a little nervous and tentative, a fearful man, a timid man in some ways, certainly at the beginning. And yet both Luke and Mark draw attention to his ministry. And Mark tells us here that he, taking courage, went into Pilate, and asked for the body of Jesus, taking courage. And the Greek word there means to gather up courage. And it's a striking phrase. Where was this man's courage? Well, it was in bits, scattered all around him. He was afraid for all sorts of reasons to be associated with Jesus, but he gathers up his courage. And it was a very courageous thing that he did. To actually go in to Pilate and ask for the body of Jesus. It took courage to do that. And Pilate, we're told, worried if, wondered if Jesus was dead, if he could be dead so soon. So he summons the centurion and there they are. Joseph of Arimathea and the centurion standing before Pilate. And Pilate asks the centurion who confirms that Jesus really was dead. And discovering that he was dead, he grants the body to Joseph. He gathered up courage. It was a very important thing and a wonderful thing for him to have done. You see, here was a man evidently with influence. Here was a man who knew Pontius Pilate. He's a prominent member of the Jewish Sanhedrin and having had courage to ask for the Lord's body, the body is laid in a specially prepared tomb and is not, as would normally have happened to a condemned man, thrown into a pit for a common burial. Now there's an example for us in this action of Joseph of Arimathea. Sooner or later, you see, he had to come off the fence. In a sense, of course, he'd already done that, but he hadn't made his allegiance to the Lord Jesus publicly known. He was a secret disciple. He was afraid of the opinion and the perhaps response of his Jewish friends and relatives and colleagues. He was afraid of what people would think of him 
if he was openly a disciple, a follower of Jesus. But eventually, he had to make a stand. And that's an example to us. An example to us, because sometimes we don't make a a stand. Sometimes we're tempted to hide our light under a bushel. But we're forced, eventually, sometimes, despite our nervousness, despite our fears, we are forced to come out into the open. And it's the cross that brings Joseph to this point. The cross. Not the miracles of Jesus. He had seen the miracles of Jesus. He'd seen the great signs. He had heard the teaching. But it was the cross. It was so wicked that Joseph could not remain silent any longer. And not only so wicked that he had to say something, but also so wonderful. He had seen the earth witnessing to Jesus, the ground shaking beneath his feet. He had seen the sun witnessing to Jesus, hiding its light. The temple witnessing to Jesus as the veil was torn in two from top to bottom. The Roman centurion, a pagan man, witnessing to Jesus the Father in heaven witnessing to Jesus. And so Joseph, gathering up courage, he witnesses also. If the earth could do it, and the sun, and the temple, and the centurion, and God, so could he. What was happening around him was so wonderful that he just had to declare his colours. Well, what about you and me then? Since our Lord Jesus has died for us, has shed his precious blood for us. Should we be ashamed of him? Whose side are we on? The world's crucifying him or God's honouring him? If you love him, serve him. Serve him. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? Well, then let me stand for him and let me confess him. Let me own him. We've just sung, haven't we? Uh, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord. And we can sing that with fervour. And uh, the words come off our tongues. It's a very different thing, isn't it, to do it. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to, to defend his cause. We sing it. And sometimes it's sort of catchy, memorable tune. But what about tomorrow morning now? When we go into work, when we meet our neighbours, I'm not ashamed. Now this man Joseph, having failed previously, recovered courage. And because of the sheer wickedness of what had been done, and because of the wonder of what had been done, he just had to speak. And that's how it ought to be with us, particularly because of the wonder of the cross that God should lay Our sins upon the Lord Jesus Christ, having given his Son in the first place. That's something that we ought to witness to. So Joseph is a great example to us. He's also an inspiration. Here was Joseph standing for Jesus at a very critical moment. It's a little bit like those boys that are placed out at sea on a reef. And uh, when the weather gets rough and it begins to rock, so the bell rings out. Well, for the people of God, this was rough weather. This was a difficult time. And Joseph begins to ring. The enemy had gone too far. During his life, the enemy had sought to stone Jesus. They called him a devil and now they've put him to death. And they've mocked him. So it's time for, Ju- for Joseph to stand up and to be counted, to tell people what they've done by blaspheming the holy name of Jesus. The time has come for Joseph to stand up. And the time has come for us today to stand up too. And to stop being so mealy-mouthed about being Christians. The name of Jesus everywhere is being blasphemed. And it's time that people knew who he is Whose side are we on? Are we on the side of the world with all its ridicule and mockery? Or on the side of God and Christ and heaven and eternity? It's time to stand up for Jesus and not to be ashamed. You see, this was a crucial 
time and a moment, a crucial moment, not only not only for that reason, but also because everybody else had gone, hadn't they? They had fled. The disciples were nowhere to be seen. They had all fled. And this man comes forward when everybody else fails. Sometimes it's like that. When other men fail, a timid man stands up. Joseph of Arimathea is ready to die for Jesus. Let others fail. Let others flee. Joseph stands his ground. Thank God for people in the history of the church of the Lord Jesus who've done that. There are so many that could be mentioned. Great old Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, 86 years of age. They had hunted him and they eventually found him in an obscure place. And when they went to arrest him, they found him on his knees. And the soldiers were reluctant to go into his room to arrest him. And when he finished praying, they took him. And they pressed him to confess that he was an atheist because he would not profess faith in the Roman gods, but he would not blaspheme. And they brought him out before a jeering crowd for his, crucif for his execution. And he waved his hand and he called out, Away with the atheists! He wouldn't deny his Lord. I have wild beasts, said the Roman consul, and if you refuse, I will throw you to them. Send for them, he said. If you despise wild beasts, then I will send you to the fire. Swear and I'll release you, curse the Christ, and you'll be free. Eighty-six years I have served. Christ said Polycarp, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme him who saved me? You threatened fire that burns for an hour and then is quenched, and you know not the fire of judgment that is to come, the fire of eternal punishment? Bring what you will. And so he died, one man, before a great, awful, jeering crowd. Are you prepared to be one man, one woman, when others fail, when others flee? One who stands for Jesus Christ. A timid man. A man who failed. A man who had been reluctant to confess Jesus because of his fear of the Jews. But now he stands. And as he stands, courage rises. And he becomes a great and a powerful testimony to Jesus Christ, Joseph of Arimathea. And it was crucial for another reason, and that is that the faith of others was so feeble. If you were these women, faithful women, loyal women, but they couldn't go to Pilate and ask for the body. They couldn't even get near to the cross. They could never have prevented the body of Jesus being thrown into a pit. They needed Someone to stand for them in their weakness. Someone to represent them. A friend. And Joseph comes forward to do that on their behalf. And he does for them what they could not do. Are we willing for that? Are we willing to stand when the faithful may be feeble? When the enemy may be raging? When friends forsake Jesus? When the faithful are weak and there are few Christians around and the ones that are around don't seem to be able to do much. Well then, at that time, your testimony may be absolutely crucial. So it's an inspiration to us and an example to us. And it's a guide. A guide because this shows us how to witness. And it shows us three things, particularly, that I'll briefly, briefly mention. The first is this, that oftentimes, witnessing for the Lord Jesus means you put yourself at risk. Joseph lost face among the Sanhedrin. And you can just imagine his predicament, can't you? They had so recently voted to deliver Jesus to execution. Joseph hadn't consented to that. And now one of their own number, a member of the Sanhedrin, comes forward to Pilate to ask for the body. Well, one thing's for certain. He couldn't show his face in the Sanhedrin again. He was never going to be accepted there again. In their eyes, 
He had lost all credibility and he had lost his reputation and his name. And not only did he lose popularity, but this meant putting his life on the line too, because he might easily have been accused and executed himself as a supporter of this subversive man who's just been crucified. But in the goodness of God, Pilate acceded to his request. But he took a risk. It was a real risk. And you can't be a witness for Jesus without taking risks. You might risk losing popularity that you have at the moment. Well, so what? So what? If your popularity depends on being mealy-mouthed and as weak as dishwater, what sort of popularity is that? What's it worth? It's the popularity of hell. If you want to be popular among people who hate Jesus, so you'll be at risk. And he's willing also for the cost involved. The cost. He's a rich man. This tomb cost him. It's a very valuable possession. Are we willing for the cost? We sing sometimes were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Do we really mean that? Do we really mean that? How much of ourselves, how much of what we have and what we are, do we actually give to God? What is Jesus worth to you? Are we willing to give ourselves to him and all that we are, to put it all at his disposal? There's a cost in bearing witness to Jesus. And Joseph also is willing for offence. He's ready for the offence. It was a preparation of the Sabbath, and here is Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, handling a dead body, the dead body of Jesus. Well, that very act would render him ceremonially unclean. Everyone would avoid him. But he's willing for that offence, handling the dead body of a crucified rabbi and knowing that everyone's going to say, what a fanatic, what a fanatic, standing with a crucified man. Are you willing to stand by the cross to bear its offence? We thank God it isn't any longer a dead body, is it, of a Jewish rabbi. But for us this evening, it's the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. But are we willing to stand with him and for him and by him? It means offence. There is an offence to the cross. People don't like it and they're disturbed by it. People are ill at ease when they're confronted with the cross. And when you talk to them about the blood of Jesus Christ, people are made very uncomfortable by, by that. Are we willing to stand there? Ready for the infamy and the shame. Yes, and for the glorious honour that God puts upon those who trust upon his Son, crucified for our sins. Here is a man then who tells us what it means to be a witness to the Lord Jesus and to his cross. The risk of the loss of popularity, the cost of giving our life and all that we are and have to him, and the offence of being identified with Jesus and his cross. But that's what he expects of us and calls us to, and that's what we are to do in his name. So let the world come to its conclusion. Here is a centurion, and here are these women, and here is Joseph of Arimathea, who come to their conclusion. And we know who came to the right conclusion, because on the third day, the Lord Jesus was raised up in glory from the grave. So we are to come to the cross, and we are to glory in the cross, and we are to put our trust and confidence in this Jesus who died upon the cross, and whose blood can make the foulest clean. And then we are to stand for him. To stand for him. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause, maintain the honour of his name, the glory. And it really is the most glorious thing. The glory of his cross. Oh, may the Lord help us to do that. Because as we begin to stand like that, well then people will 
see, for one thing, that we really believe this message and that this gospel really does matter and that God is and that Christ died and that Christ really does save. And maybe in the goodness of God they'll listen and we shall see other people drawn and attracted and brought to the same Saviour which I trust we love and serve. Well, may he bless his word to us tonight.